I'm pleased to welcome back to the program Dr. Christopher DiCarlo, who's an award-winning philosopher, educator, and author of his latest book on critical thinking called Six Steps to Better Thinking, How to Disagree and Get Along. Uh, it's great to have you back. You know, this is a topic that's very, very interesting to me. And we've talked a lot about sort of the discoveries that behavioral economics has made over the last several decades that oftentimes when you present people you're arguing with with sort of uh, counter contradictory information, we would like to imagine that they're going to see the light and sort of change their mind. But very, very often this is not actually the way it goes. And you talk in the book about how to have some of those conversations and not only get along, but maybe be, be more effective. So let's start there. Well, what's a good general principle to think about when you're debating something like politics with other people that disagree? Right. Uh, to me, the first thing you have to do is be aware of your own biases and why you've arrived at your current position. Mm -hmm. And then to be able to wonder why that other person is thinking differently from you and what biases might have led them to that same, uh, you know, opposing viewpoint. And when you do that, the goal is what, or I guess is your goal or should your goal be to change minds? What would be the best approach empirically speaking to have the best shot at doing that? Right. So if the art of argumentation is tr trying to persuade somebody of your particular position, and you're better aware of, a, of your own biases within the context of what the other person's biases might be. This goes a long way towards trying to find some type of uh, uh, medium point between where you're, you're both coming down. And so it becomes easier to try to reach out to that person with whom you're disagreeing and be able to communicate more clearly and more effectively. That's interesting because in some cases, the sort of truth might be a middle ground between two positions, but very often that's not the case, right? And I find that that's a, a sort of a starting point for a lot of people uh, who say, well, listen, this is the position of one side and this is the position of the other side. And more than likely, we all have our biases and the truth is sort of somewhere in the middle. But a lot of times that that's really not the case, right? Like the truth might be, uh, the view that is typically uh, subscribed to by a political party or a particular movement or an institution or whatever the case may be. So how do you deal with that? How do you deal with the reality that very often the truth isn't just the sort of average of all the positions that are out there? Right. So there are a number of techniques that can be used uh, in cases like that. You can use the Socratic approach, which I, I personally like, where in order to try to get somebody who has opposing views about a, a position that in all, in all perspectives is simply wrong, you can get them to talk through it. And what Socrates did is he started off by agreeing with the person. So it's kind of like, well, let's assume that you're right. This is known as a reductio ad absurdum. Let's assume that you're right and let's follow along where your propositions, where your premises lead. And if you can try to get the person to walk through their particular understanding of a topic, they themselves might be able to see where it is they've made, you know, a fallacy or a fallacious form of reasoning. So that's the Socratic form. Um, another form is you try to find shared values with the other person and then try to appreciate coming at it from the point of view of a shared value. Uh, can they, can they uh, see any way in which they might question what they currently believe and, and un better understand why it is you hold your per particular opinion. So those are two techniques that I use. What's your opinion of, um, I, I don't know where this idea started and I, I don't think it's original to Peter Bogosian, but he's popularized the defeasibility question, right? Which is what evidence, if I could present you with it, would change your mind as sort of a starting point to getting people to think, wait, if, if the answer is there's no evidence that would change my mind, maybe I'm not actually basing my opinion on the evidence. What's your opinion of that strategy? Right. It's, it's not a bad strategy, but it immediately uh, conf confronts a person. And what happens if you're talking about cherished beliefs about hot button issues uh, and a person already has an enormous amount 
of emotional baggage that they're bringing to that that topic, uh, asking them that question might not have uh, much of an impact on them if they've already uh, invested so much emotional uh, 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 activity into basically maintaining that position. So it could have some uh, uh, efficacy in terms of getting them to try to understand that if they're not willing to consider the possibility of being in error in any way, then then they have to admit that they are dogmatists. Well, all you've done is really basically pointed out an obvious fact that in, in case of, say, uh, religious belief or whatnot, um, you, you're really just calling attention to the fact that they're just going to say, yeah, and the reason why I'm dogmatic is because I'm right and mm -hmm. I'm certain and you're the one who has issues. So sometimes it, it can help, but I don't, I don't know if it, if it always will be uh, productive. Many of us have been involved in uh, political disagreements or discussions where you can sort of sense it, and it's hard to say exactly when it crosses the line, but at a certain point, it gets tense. And sometimes you notice that you might be starting to get a little hot in the underarms, or there's just something that you sort of sense that the conversation has crossed from sort of a friendly conversation into one where people are starting to get upset. In your mm. experience, what causes it to cross that line? Yeah, I mean, uh, you're really kind of talking about, you know, elements of randomness and, and, and chaos where uh, things can occur quite unpredictably in terms of uh, what might set people off and what might cause that kind of, uh, you know, emotional turmoil. But not and, uh, and, and not so much specifically, but what type of shift in the conversation is what usually gets to those uh, discussions that no longer feel OK? Oftentimes it's a personal account. So if you've struck a nerve with somebody who has had very personal experiences with whatever that topic is, right, if it's a you're talking about abortion, gun control, euthanasia, any any major topics, uh, aspects of politics. If a person has uh, felt that within their lives, and now that's somehow brought up, now well, that's often a case where you're going to see somebody, you know, take uh, a bit of a turn towards more kind of serious emotional issue uh, or uh, a slant towards the issue. Hmm. Uh, in, in your opinion, are the debates about religion and debates about politics, are they more similar or different? In, in other words, we could say, well, they both relate to sort of dogmas that one might subscribe to. They both relate to you know, ideas that people are emotionally invested in. But are they really similar types of disagreements or is religion sort of its own thing? The difference with uh, politics and religion, they're not always separate, but uh with with religion you have to understand every time a very deeply religious person gets up in the morning they have in their minds the belief that the information that they're in possession of is reflective of what is absolutely true about the nature of the universe that's no small um uh, amount of 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 information and uh, with politics, this can vary. You know, a young man begins as a liberal and, you know, enters middle age and, and, and old age as a conservative. With a uh, with religion, that's a totally different story. You're talking about the fabric of reality now. You're talking about something so strong within a person's mind. It's it, essentially there is no drug in comparison with religious conviction. I mean... That gets a person higher than any drug could possibly get them. And if you're going to try to argue against what it is that gets him that gets them that high, it's like taking the needle from from the heroin addict or the bottle from the alcoholic. They're go often going to fight you on that because this is what provides them with that comfort, you know, feeling what I call mimetic equilibrium, where the world makes sense, the universe makes sense. And all of a sudden, you you want to enter into their worldview, doubts and you know the capacity for error and being wrong or being misguided. That's extremely uh, uh, deleterious and harmful to their particular worldview. So it, that's how it differs from from politics, religion, and politics.
what are the six steps to better thinking that you outline in the book to dig into that material a little bit more? Sure. Um, very easy to remember. The six steps match the first six uh, letters of the alphabet. So A is for argument. People have to know how to formulate their ideas into the form of an argument so that they're better understood. Uh, B is for bias. We have to understand why it is we believe what we do and what led us to this particular point in time. C is for context. Information doesn't exist in a vacuum. It's always embedded within some particular type of context. Uh, D is for diagram. People can learn a skill in which when they hear or see or read what a person is saying, uh, there are skills, there are tools that allow them to literally draw out what that argument looks like so that they can see it on paper. Uh, e is for evidence. Uh, if you're going to support your argument with evidence, there are various different types. Um, F is for fallacies. There's a lot of different types of fallacies, which are errors in reasoning. So this capacity allows us to better identify when somebody is making an error in reasoning. And now we can put a name to the face, so to speak. Can everybody can learn everybody? this? Um, and, and if so, is there sort of some natural inclination to either be comfortable in these engaging in these types of disagreements, discussions and debates? Because I get a lot of people who, who tell me, listen, I, I sort of when I'm on my own, I like thinking about these things and sort of thinking about what my positions are on, on whatever issue. But I am just not able to engage in a back and forth with someone else. And it's not a question of knowledge of facts. It's just I, I constitutionally I freeze up. I, I can't do it. It's not for me. Do you think these are skills anybody can learn? Well, of course. And they're skills of empowerment. I mean, I've been lobbying the Ontario government here for easily the last five years. And I've made some headway with a, a pilot project with uh, one of the school, school boards here in Ontario to introduce critical thinking skills into the curriculum for grades nine and 10 so that if they can learn them at those grades and then carry them forward in grades 11 and 12, they will offer them uh, levels of empowerment where they have the capacity now to be able to better understand why it is they believe what they do. Hmm. So, um, you know, I've, I've also visited uh, other countries as well throughout the world. I have a, a not-for-profit called the Critical Thinking Project. And what we do is we, we travel around the world or we Skype around the world and we teach teachers the basics of critical thinking so that in other countries outside of our own um, uh, teachers and students can learn these critical thinking skills and then the plan is allow them to solve their problems their way by by using these particular skills the book is six steps to better thinking how to disagree and get along we've been speaking with the book's author dr christopher di carlo Thanks again for talking to me about this and glad to have you back on the program. My pleasure, anytime.